your financial advisors. A registered investment advisor, this show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full informed investment decision. This is your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMV. Now, here's Joe Anderson and Big Al Clopine. Hey, welcome back to the program. The show's called Your Money or Wealth. Uh, my name's Joe Anderson. I'm a certified financial planner. Alan Klopine is a CPA. Uh, Want to get into something we haven't talked about quite a bit, Al, on, on the program. Charitable giving. Yeah, there's a lot to that, Joe. And I think a lot of people think that, well, all right, I guess I can write a check to charity and maybe I get a tax deduction. I don't really know quite how much it means to me, but I've been told it's a good thing to do. But it turns out that there are a lot of great charitable strategies, and uh, some of these actually work rather well, even if you're not that charitably inclined. They actually can benefit you quite a bit. Right. So I guess there's two things to consider. One is, of course, you know, number one is the charity, right? There's a lot of really good causes out there. But there's also a lot of scams, too, that you have to true. be careful of. Very true. Um, so w- once you vet out, to make sure that it's a legitimate charity, uh, then it's, okay, well, what's the best way to give to this particular charity? Right. And we'll get into basics. Like, you could volunteer, right? You could volunteer for an organization. You could do a one-time gift. Maybe you want to, um, or how are you going to give? Do you give cash or do you give other type of assets? We'll get into that. Uh, There's something that's called a donor advice fund. We can talk um, because that's a phenomenal strategy it in really, a lot of it really is. in a lot of cases. Right. Uh, then there's the the IRA contributions, right? So if you are over seventy and a half and you're taking required distributions, uh, there's a way to avoid or reduce the required distribution. Um, we could get into charitable gift annuities and then maybe a, a tax exempt trust or charitable trust. So maybe we spent the next segment and a half or something like that just. Busting this stuff down and looking at the pros and cons of each of the different strategy that, that that people can do. Yeah, Joe, let's start right off the bat with volunteering because a lot of people get confused about that. Now, volunteer time is not tax deductible because some people want to say, well, you know what? I normally make thirty bucks an hour, so if I volunteer a day, then I should thirty dollars, you know, times eight hours or. $240, that should be my charitable deduction. And that doesn't work that way. Time does not create a tax deduction. However, here's what does create a tax deduction for volunteering. That's your mileage uh, to uh, uh, and from a, some kind of a charitable event that you go to. Or maybe you have to travel to another city or state or even country for that matter. Supplies that you purchase directly for charity. And there are some fundraising expenses that will qualify for tax deductions. So a lot of people miss those ex- those deductions. And, and a deduction, what that does is that reduces your taxable income, which then ultimately reduces the amount of tax that you pay. Hey, so our um, producer for our TV show, Ty, he's doing a charitable event on, I think, tonight. Yes, I think and so, And so too. he put that together, and it's for Rady's Children's Hospital. And he's getting, um, I think it's a, a fashion show. He's got a bunch of NFL players going to this. It's in La Jolla. And so let's say he spent $10,000 or something like that putting this event together. Right. Would that be deductible? Yeah, if, if, it, if it was not reimbursed by the charity and it was for charitable purposes, you, he would have a very good argument that that's tax deductible. So if we wanted to put together an event for right. whatever particular charity, right? Uh, then that event that, I mean, because a lot of times people will go to these charitable events, right? And they'll hobnob and have champagne and sure. you know, do all of this. But if you throw that event, most of that potentially could be tax it, deductible? It, it could be. I mean, you have to kind of do the reasonableness test. I mean, so if, you, if you're spending $10,000 for an event and it raises $500, you know, probably that was more of a social event than a charitable event. So there's there's some hoops that you got to go through. It's probably too complicated to go through right now. But yeah, that that's the concept, Joe. Which is if you're spending money for charitable purposes for a specific charity, right? Then those dedu- those expenses may be tax deductible. And then you look at all right. Well, maybe you just give a one time gift, right? You you yeah. You know, I, I, an event happens. Yeah, I'd say that's most common. And some people give cash. Some people write checks. Some people uh, do uh, direct uh, contributions online. 
right? And and certainly a check or an online donation is preferred because you have a you have proof of that. If it's just cash, you don't really have any proof. And if the IRS does audit you, there's a good likelihood that that will be disallowed because you don't really have proof for that. Unless, Joe, unless that cash donation is over $250 and the charity at that point is supposed to give you a written acknowledgement of that gift, that could suffice if you give in cash. But I would say, I, I would strongly encourage checks or online donations because that way you've got proof of that donation as to when it happened. Looking at, let's say, giving a car away, like Father Joe's or something like sure. that. Yeah. Who does the, the, do you just look at Kelly Blue Book? Yeah, you used to, and that got so abused, the IRS said no more. So now here's what happens is the uh, Father Joe's will sell your car, and whatever they sell it for, they'll send you a 1099 as to what that they sold it for, and that's your tax deduction. So what? here's what was happening. People would say their $1,000 junker car was worth 6000 bucks, right. and writing off 6000 bucks, and they're in a 50% tax bracket, so they saved $3,000 tax for their $1,000 car. And IRS got wind of that and said no more. So anything over 250 bucks. So if I give something over under 250 I don't have to have documentation? You have to have documentation that you actually gave, like a check like or a, online, avoid a check or something. but you don't need an acknowledgement from the charity. Then you look at, all right, well, what is the best way to give? But, I mean, if you're giving 250 bucks, I mean, cash is probably okay. But if you're looking at maybe five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, yeah. then you have to, is cash the best way? Because Al and I have seen this mistake quite often, is that someone will sell maybe a, a position, a stock position, or a mutual fund, or something like that, pay the tax on it, and then give those proceeds to the charity. Right, and so they pay the tax, as you said. A better way to do that, Joe, is to give the appreciated stock directly to charity because the tax deduction that you get is the current value of the stock on the day that you donate it, and you don't have to pay tax on the gain. So here's an example, like a stock's worth, call it $20,000, and and you only paid 1000 bucks for it. So that would be a $19,000 gain if you sold it. Well, you can give that stock directly to charity, and most charities will accept stock. They're savvy to this. And so you get a $20,000 tax deduction, and you do not have to pay taxes on that $19,000 of gain. That's, that's your real advantage there. So smaller charities won't take the, the stock? Some won't. I mean, if they're not really set up for that, but virtually any charity of any size, that's a common way to donate because it's 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 so preferred because the charity gets that stock and when they sell it, they don't pay tax either because they're a nonprofit entity. So let's say you gave twenty thousand dollars and your tax basis on that was five thousand. So you have a fifteen thousand dollar capital gain right. that you would have to pay tax on. So that's fifteen percent federal. You know, let's say ten percent state, just to make the math easy. Sure. Or if, depending on your income, someone giving that much might be in a higher income, so then their capital gain tax might be higher than 15% at the net investment income. Right. You can avoid that several thousand dollars yes. just by giving the, the, the stock directly or the yeah. mutual fund or whatever investment directly to that plus, charity. Plus, you get to yeah, deduct that $20,000 deduction, get, and whatever your tax rate is, you save on that. So you kind of get a double benefit. You don't pay the tax on the gain, and you get the full deduction on the um, on the charitable dinner. So that really is a good way to go. And, and particularly, Joe, when you um, have a situation where you want to give a larger amount, uh, it's uh, clearly the, the way to go. And, Joe, I, I think we talk about this, and, and a lot of people don't necessarily pay attention to this because they don't realize they have any control over their taxes. And, and the truth is that you do. You've got lots of control over your taxes as long as you know what the rules are and how to apply them. And in particular, in retirement, you've got more control than any other time in your life. But I will tell you this, that that the best way to maximize that is to have a forward-looking, tax-efficient strategy. We'll be right back. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joey Anderson, Big Al, hanging out on a Saturday. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, go to our website, purefinancial.com. Got a lot of different um, events coming down the pike. Webinar uh, for Medicare is coming up next week, so you can uh, learn all about Medicare with Dr. Katie Boltava. Uh, so just go to purefinancial.com there, sign up for the webinar if you'd like to learn about Medicare. It's going to be an hour long. Uh, the ins and outs of Medicare, all the things that you need to do. 
Uh, so purefinancial.com. Then uh, sign up at iTunes. Get the podcast for Your Money, Your Wealth. And uh, so you can listen to us. If you happen to leisure. miss us on Saturday morning, you can hear us anytime. What um, we're talking about is some different tax ideas. Well, out of the box a little bit. Um, we talk about Roth IRA conversions, tax loss harvesting, Roth, you know, d- distribution planning, um, asset location. I mean, there's multiple different things that we talk about in regards to tax on the show. Uh, but there's other things that you can potentially do to reduce your taxes. So if you look at your Schedule A, for instance, right? So when you look at your tax return, you say, all right, well, how can I increase my Schedule A? Those are your deductions to make sure that that reduces your taxable income, hence reduces the amount of money that you pay in tax. Well, you know, the top one is medical expenses. Well, you don't really want to increase that, right? The last thing you want to do is, oh, God, let me get sick so I can save money in taxes. Yeah, that would not be desirable. <laughs> that, that is not a That's great... a consolation phrase is what it is. Right. Then it's uh, what's in state taxes. Well, you get to write off your state taxes. State of California, we pay a lot of taxes in California. But, yeah, that's another consolation prize. Uh, but I guess if you're making a lot of money, that's cool. But then you got to pay a lot of tax. Yeah, and, Joe, those state taxes, those are not deductible if you're subject to alternative, alternative minimum, minimum tax. tax. Yeah. And so in a lot of cases, folks don't even get the benefit of those deductions. Same with property taxes, by the way. <laughs> then you have charitable gifts. So, or mortgage expense as well. So if you have a big mortgage, uh, then you can write that off. But charitable, right? So we look at thousands of tax returns. And a lot of you give a lot to charity. A lot of you don't give a lot to charity, which is fine. You're family inclined versus charitable inclined. But if you look at some of the strategies that we're going to get into, because the IRS forgives a tax if you plan a gift. So the money's going to go somewhere. We're all charitably inclined. We're giving to the IRS, yeah, if, if we don't have a charity, it's picked for you. It's it, called Internal Revenue Service. It, yes. So if you can get a little bit more sophisticated in some of your tax planning and combine a couple of these different strategies together, right? you can save money in tax, actually maybe create a little bit more income uh, because you're paying less in tax. And guess what? A really good organization of your choice that you're passionate about is going to be able to, to benefit from your gift. And a lot of what Al and I see is that people feel more fulfilled when they give while they're living versus maybe you know leaving it as a beneficiary uh, when they pass. Correct. I, I would say that too. And boy, Joe, I, I would say right off the bat, and, and w- we saw this situation recently uh, with a client where, you know, so the um, husband just retired, making a good salary, but when he retired, um, he also had all kinds of vacation pay. He had like four months of vacation pay. So all of a sudden the salary goes up because of that. And a whole bunch of stock options that he had not yet exercised. And when you exercise a stock option, by the way, here's what happens. The difference between your stock option price and the current market price is considered the spread. And the spread actually goes on your W-2, goes on your income. So whereas normally he made, you know, I don't know, $150,000 a year, let's say, because of all this extra money that he got, uh, it was this, the salary was expected to be about $500,000 in the one year. So clearly, he and his wife are going to be in a much higher tax bracket this year. Now, then you look at their, um, their goals and, and inclinations, and they're charitable. They like to give to their church. And it's like, all right, so you normally give you know, five, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 a year to your church. Wouldn't it be nice if you could take some of those contributions that you're going to keep doing in retirement, by the way, because that was their goal, you could sort of bunch those up and take them all in the year that you uh, are in a higher tax bracket. And there is a way to do that, and it's called a donor-advised fund. You can actually set up a fund at a brokerage firm. It's a special account that you control the investments, and then you decide what charities get what amounts. In this case, they're likely going to give to their church over time. But here's the key. The key is the year that you set up the account and put the money in the account, your own money in the account, that is the year you get the tax deduction. And so you can imagine if your income is 500000 this year, maybe next year you retire, your income is going to be $80,000, for example. You're going to be in a much higher tax bracket. So that $8,000 charitable deduction is going to be a lot more meaningful, the tax benefit this year than next year. So why don't you take... 
you know, even 10 years of charity, in that case, maybe it's seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, put that in a donor advised fund, you get a seventy dollars or $80,000 tax deduction. Next year, when you're ready to give money to the church, you just pull it out of the fund. Now, of course, you don't get a deduction again because you've already taken it up front, but it's a great way to get a tax deduction in a year where you're in a higher tax bracket. Right. So if you think about it, it's like, all right, well, how can I reduce the overall taxable income this year? Because maybe, like you said, you had, you had a larger income year, or maybe you've done some other type of planning, such as Roth IRA conversions that added um, income to your tax return. If you give to charity anyway, it might make sense to bunch those up. You can take the 10 years, like Al said, put it in a fund. You have full control over the fund. And if you want to ch- switch charities, you can switch charities. It's almost like a, a private foundation. It really is. You have a lot of control over that. And and it's it, unlike a private foundation. You don't have to set up an organization and do all that stuff, file tax returns. This is just a special account that yeah, you hold. Yeah, and it's pretty it. inexpensive. To, I mean, the, the setup is virtually setup is nothing. It's virtually free. And that, there's some ongoing administration costs. But compared to the tax benefit that you get, it can be pretty gigantic. And then something else I would say about that is if you, let's say in this example, they decide to give $80,000 to this donor advice fund. Well, they can write a check for $80,000. But better yet, why don't they look at their, their stocks that are outside of their retirement accounts, pick the ones that have the highest gains. Why don't they give those stocks to the donor advice funds, just like last segment we were talking about. You get They'll get the tax deduction for the value of the stock when they put it in the donor advice fund, but they don't have to pay tax on that gain. And it, then you take your cash that you're going to give to the charity, and then you buy the stock back at a higher basis. You betcha. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a great way to go. These are things that I, I would say a lot of people miss miss because they don't really know what the rules are. And I, Joe, I would, I would in, in some ways call this uh, mistakes. And, and, and I'm not saying this in a bad way because it's just, in, a, in essence, a, it's a little bit of ignorance on what, what's available, what the tax law is. And being a CPA for more than 30 years, it just does amaze me how people fail to get the message about tax planning, in this case, charitable planning, until they make a mistake that can cost them thousands of dollars. And a lot of people- Or missed opportunity. A lot of people don't even realize they're making a mistake because they don't even know what that opportunity is. And boy, to me, that's the last thing you want to do because there are strategies out there that are available to you. All you have to do is know what they are and take advantage of them because you can save more on taxes than you think. But you got to know what the strategies are. We'll be right back. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Now back to Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 AFMB. Hey, welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. My name's Joe Anderson. I'm a certified financial planner. I'm with Alan Klopine. He's a CPA. Uh, go to purefinancial.com. Get a little bit more information about our firm right there, purefinancial.com. Talking about some tax strategies uh, that coincide with giving to charity. And it's like, wait a minute, I don't want to give to charity. I want to give to my family. Or maybe some of you, yes, absolutely. I love giving to charity. So there's different things that we've talked about. Maybe volunteering. Now, you just went down to Mexico and volunteered your time. Correct. How was that? I uh, loved it. Uh, this was a home in Mexico that um, that houses children that have either been abandoned or um, their parents are incarcerated. And you know what? These kids are just starving for kind of parental type attention. So, yeah, I went there. It was a couple, maybe three weeks ago. And uh, boy, some of these kids, they just tug on your heart and you play with them. And it's it was just such a great experience. And, and I think a lot of us have uh, different charities that we that we are important to us. In some cases, it's uh, it, it's charities that are around maybe a disease, like figuring out a cure for a disease because we have a loved one that we've lost. In other cases, it's it's um, it's maybe um, our church or some kind of religious organization. And, and in many cases, Joe, I would say uh, a lot of great charities involved human services, you know, people that are disadvantaged for one reason or another. And it just, it does, it does feel good to give to those kind of organizations. You know, as people um, get closer to retirement or for those of you that are in retirement, you know, volunteering is a, is a key component of, you know, of their daily life, you know, getting involved with different charities, getting involved with different clubs and things of that nature. And what we talked about a couple of segments ago is that, yes, of course, you know, that is your passion and everything, you, you know, going to these giving your time and but on the flip side you don't want to let things fall through the cracks yeah. so there's still write-offs that you can potentially do 
Because the IRS encourages us to. They, um, they sure do. They want us to give because they, the government knows that they can't give to everybody. So they're hoping that the, the people give. And, uh, and these organizations, uh, the IRS cannot be the world's charity. So they're, they're hoping that you and I give our time and our money. One, one way that's often overlooked, and this is a fairly recent strategy, Joe, is you can take your um, money out of your IRA and give it directly to charity. And this, it's been around for the last few years, but unfortunately, it's been one of those things that expires every year. And then, and then what happens is, all right, are they going to renew it? And they don't renew it until December of the year that's already happened, and it doesn't give you enough time to plan. It's been the goofiest thing. But a year ago, they made this permanent. So if you are 70 and a half, uh, you can give up to $100,000 from your IRA uh, and if you're married, that's two hundred thousand dollars from your IRA. And guess what? But it'd have to be from each spouse's IRA. Each spouse, each spouse would have to have an IRA for a couple hundred thousand, right? But here's the kicker: it can count for your required minimum distribution. And I'm not saying you have to give away a hundred thousand. I mean, maybe, maybe with your church, they they they're building a new sanctuary, and you want to give them ten thousand bucks. It doesn't really matter what the amount is. I'm just telling you the total that you could do. And we had a, a client case recently, Joe, where it's interesting because they were over 70 and a half. It was a husband and wife, age 73. They'd paid off their home, so there's no mortgage interest. They they bought their home a long time ago, so their property taxes were very low, so they, 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 they didn't itemize their deductions. They had a standard deduction. They wanted to give $10,000 to their church, but interestingly enough, it wasn't going to help them because even the $10,000 donation would not give them enough deductions to itemize. So it's completely wasted. So here's the thing. From a tax perspective. From a t- well, yeah. Let me, it's not waste. They're given to their church. True. Thank you for that <laughs> point. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah. From a tax perspective. Yes. Right? So here's the thing. They couldn't write it off. Couldn't write it off. So what about this? What if they give it directly from their IRA? So in this case, they had about a $30,000 required distribution. So now it's $20,000. So they're taxed 10000 less on that. And interestingly enough, because they had less income from their IRA, less of their Social Security was taxed. Because when your income is high enough, up to 85% of your Social Security is taxed at your regular tax rates. But with less income, less of that Social Security is taxed. So they actually had about $6,000 less of Social Security that was taxed. So as a result of giving directly from their IRA to charity, they were able to save about $2,600 in tax that would have been gone had they just written the check straight to their church, which and they if, could have done. Yeah, if you do the math, I mean, they gave 10000 to the church. And so one, they could just write a check, and then their tax bill doesn't change. The other, they gave 10000 directly from their IRA. So what did that do? That reduces the amount of income that shows up on the 1040. Mm-hmm. With that, because of their threshold that they're in, less of their Social Security was going to be subject to tax. So they saved 2600 bucks on a $10,000 gift. That's 26%. Right. That's a huge number That's from a, a percentage perspective. It, it is a big number, and it's like $2,600. It's like, And some people will say, well, that doesn't sound like a very good deal. Give away ten thousand dollars to get to save twenty six hundred dollars in tax. But, but you gave. I mean, you here, wanted to give here, anyway. Here's the point: you wanted to give. Is there a smarter way to do that? If you write a check, there's no tax benefit. If you give directly from your IRA, in this example, you save twenty six hundred dollars, or as you said, twenty six percent. So when you look at, and each individual is going to be a little bit different here because it depends on what your adjusted gross income is. So if you take it directly from the IRA versus uh, taking it from another source, right? So there's pros and cons depending on what your income is, what your assets levels are, what the ultimate goal is, and so on. So, I mean, this is just a quick example of an individual that was able to save, you know, 26% tax on that $10,000 donation, 2600 bucks. Hypothetically, of course, this is just a hypothetical example. Yes. Uh, but there's uh, th- this is why tax planning is so key. I mean, 2600 bucks, I mean, that's a right, it could be a, a, a nice little short vacation. Right? I mean, that's a lot of money for a lot of individuals and it's just looking at things in every, looking at things just from a different lens. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. And, and and to me, that's why tax planning is important, and particularly when it's, when it's around charitable planning. Because as we talked about in the last couple segments, I mean, you can, you can certainly volunteer your time. You don't get a tax deduction for that, but maybe some of your direct expenses for the charity you get to write off. You can certainly write a check 
or do an online donation to charity, uh, and that's a good way to go. But better yet is giving away your appreciated stock because then you get the full tax deduction and you don't have to pay taxes on the difference. And uh, certainly a donor advice fund is a great way to go because you can set up a special account, put dollars into that account, and then uh, get the tax deduction the year that the dollars go into the account even though charity will get it maybe many years down the road. So you do that when you have a high income year, and certainly the, this IRA direct contributions to charity. This is now a permanent law, by the way, for those that are over 70 and a half. And Joe, it's, it's why we, we want to take time for our listeners that are interested to sit down with you and show you what these charitable strategies can be. If you're thinking of doing some, maybe some larger one-time donations, or maybe you have ongoing uh, commitments to charity that you want to keep on going, are you doing it the best possible way? And in many cases, maybe you are, and in probably a lot of cases, you're not. There's probably other ways to do this to create more benefit for yourself. And, and I got to tell you, the, the way I look at it, there's, there's no harm in getting a tax benefit. The IRS encourages it. You just have to know what's available and what to do. We'll be right back. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Now back to Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the show. The show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson, Big Al Quilpine hanging out. Go to purefinancial.com. Get more information about us. We are a fee-only registered investment advisor. All the time. 100% of the time. Not just part of the time. Not just part of the time. There are we firms. are not dually registered. There we are, only yeah. have um, a Series 65. That means uh, registered investment advisors. We're not even licensed to sell stocks, bonds, mutual funds, annuities, or anything else. We gave up those licenses a long time ago because yeah, we which, don't want to sell them. Right, which, by the way, is a good thing because those that do sell, they're paid via commission. And I'm not saying that anyone that does that is bad. There's a lot of great advisors out there that, that do uh, are operate under that system. But you never quite know, are you getting the best advice for you, or is this the, the product that's going to give this advisor the best commission? Sure. Yeah, and we're not um, insurance licensed. Uh, basically, we are just a registered investment advisor. Uh, we charge fees for service. We charge fees for financial planning. Uh, we charge fees to um, manage assets. Uh, and everything that comes as revenue to our firm is paid uh, via our client. And we work really hard for those fees. Um, so there's no, here we sold, we made a commission. And then so we get paid a big check up front. And then if the client's unsatisfied or everything else, well, who cares? We still got paid. No, we get paid um, for our service on a quarterly basis. And then anytime the client is unsatisfied with the service that we provide, uh, they can go elsewhere. Uh, we feel that that's the only way to do business. Uh, so we are a fee-only registered investment advisor. We're a financial planning firm uh, that manages assets. And part of financial planning is taking a look at taxes. And then when in regards to taxes, you also have to take a look at your estate plan. And a lot of times when we run an analysis, let's say, is that someone, um, client A, B comes in and we'll say, all right, well, when do you want to retire? All right, we want to retire at 66, and here's how much money that we want to spend, and here's how much money that we have, and here's what we're saving. So we spend a lot of time looking at, first of all, cash flow needs. All right, so here's the assets that you have. Here's your fixed income sources, such as Social Security, maybe a pension. Here's the shortfall. Here's the demand from the overall portfolio. So we take a look at that, we, and, and we forecast that out until life expectancy. Uh, so 95 is what we usually run it at, unless a client wants us to run it out even further. So we'll run it out. And then from there, then you have a better view of, all right, well, here's where the taxes are going to be um, given their required distributions. Let's say a spouse passes away. What is that going to do? And that's all determined on where the assets are held. If it's all in a 401k plan, all of those taxes are at ordinary income. If they're not in a 401k plan, let's say outside of a 401k plan, well, then they're taxed at capital gains rates. So we can kind of take a look at what is the appropriate tax plan today by looking in the future. Right? It's not looking in the rearview mirror. We're looking in the future to say, here's what to expect given the asset level that you have, given your goals, given your income needs, and here's what your fixed income sources are. In, in some cases, we'll look and someone will have a large surplus at end of life, several million dollars, let's say, given conservative rates of return. And so they'll say, oh, and then we can say, all right, well, do you want to spend a little bit more money or do you want to have more money go to the kids or would you like to do some charitable 
Uh, so all of this kind of comes into play because your cash flow needs is going to, right? So cash flow is dependent on taxes. And if you do a right tax plan, then your cash flows are going to increase. And then from there, you can see how you manage the assets on a conservative basis to make sure you get the cash flow, not run out of money. But then if you have a large surplus at the end of life, then that dictates the estate plan. And then when you're looking at estate planning, maybe charitable giving is part of your overall estate plan. So once you get a better picture on how all of this looks, you're better, you, you'll make better decisions. So then we can look today and say, you know what, you're going to have maybe potentially some excess capital. Because I think that's why a lot of times, Alan, people don't maybe want to give to charity while they're living. They would much rather do it when, if there's anything left, then the charity can get it. Sure. Because I, I want to make sure I take care of myself and my spouse first, then charity can have anything that's left. But if they look at it maybe a little bit differently, they can say, hey, I can now give while I'm alive and get a tax deduction to boot. And you know what? If you run the numbers again, you might even have more money left over because of the tax savings up front and the time value of money and everything else that goes along with that. Yes, Joe. And there are certain strategies where you actually get benefits as well as the charity. For example, there's something called a charitable gift annuity where you can, certain charities have these. It's, uh, it's not a commercial annuity, it's a charitable annuity. So you give to charity, and the charity then pays you monthly payments for life, just like a, a, an annuity. So as long as you're living, uh, you'll receive payments. And they can do that on one life, or if you're married, they can do it on two lives. So if you or your spouse are alive, you'll still be getting these payments. But here's the benefit is you get a tax deduction right up front because there is a charitable component here and you get an income stream for life. And so this can be a great strategy for those that have a charity that they want to give to, but yet want to retain some of that benefit for themselves. So like gift annuities, universities have good um, gift annuities. Yes, they do. And, and my parents, uh, they actually have two of them. They gave to the National Park Service Foundation and they gave to the Smithsonian. And in both cases, they received tax deductions in the year that they gave the donation, and now they have payment streams for life. And it's two organizations that they feel passionate about, they love. And so getting that check every month, it's like, uh, first of all, it helps their cash flow, but it reminds them, you know what? We helped out these organizations. It feels kind of good, actually. A couple of um, quick other notes here, and then we got to get out of here, is that uh, there's a more complex strategy, um, and it's called a tax-exempt trust uh, or a charitable remainder trust. And basically the, the, the concept, high level here, on how this, partic- this, this product works, because th- there's a lot of confusion. Let's say you have a highly appreciated asset, oh, we'll say real estate. You bought it you know, for $100,000 30 years ago, now it's worth a million bucks, something like that. And it's depreciated down to nothing, so you get a million dollar gain. Last thing most people want to do is sell that outright, because then they have to pay capital gains tax on a million bucks. So now you have a what a twenty some odd percent um, capital gains rate plus ten, you're in plus depreciation recapture. You, you lose about forty percent of the asset, right to tax. Correct. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, yeah. And so it's like okay, well now I lose four hundred thousand dollars in tax. I net out six hundred thousand on a million dollar you know investment. One way to do it is you could put this into a tax exempt trust. The trust sells the property. The trust is tax exempt, so it does not pay any tax. So now you have a million dollars of cash sitting in this trust that you can invest any way that you like. If you want to buy more real estate, if you want to buy stocks, bonds, mutual funds, CDs, whatever. Then you can start distributing that trust back to you in a form of income. Then the income is taxed at four tiers. It's ordinary income, it's capital gains, it's tax-free and a return of basis. So there, right, then you're going to be taking some capital, right, your basis, your, whatever the, the, the investment makes is going to be taxed either at cap gains, ordinary income, or tax-free, depending on what type of investment that's generating whatever income inside that trust. So it's a way to spread out the tax over your lifetime, right? And then it's a, it's a way to really accelerate the amount of income to the household. The caveat is, is that at your you and your spouse's passing, um, a percentage of that particular asset will go to charity. How you would potentially want to set it up, you can set this up hundreds of different ways, but to maximize it, uh, 10% of the asset goes to charity at end of life. So then you just got to think, all right, do I want to pay 40% today in tax or 10% at the end of my life? Well, 
I think everyone can agree 10% of end of life is probably a better deal. Plus, you get a tax deduction today by putting it in the trust. In that example, you would get a $100,000 tax deduction that you would be able to write off the income that's coming from the trust or utilize that with other type of income that you have coming in. It's Joe. It's a, it's a great example of a way to to take a highly appreciated piece of real estate or maybe a business that or you're trying to sell or, or whatever. stock, whatever, right? Put it in this tax exempt trust, sell it, pay no tax currently, receive an income stream for life, and then you, uh, th- when you pass, as you say, or you and your spouse pass, the charity gets the balance in the account. But over time, these are designed so that ninety percent of the principal comes back out to you, and it's yet another example of how tax planning can really impact your your future uh, p- uh, profits, income. When you can save on taxes, your money can stretch a lot further, and you don't have to take as much risk in the stock market and other types of investments. And a lot of folks don't realize they have control over their taxes to a certain measure. The fact is you do, especially in retirement. You have more control over taxes than any other time in your life. But in our experience, many advisors are not talking to you guys about this because it's not their expertise. The only way to lower your taxes that I know of is to have a forward-looking tax-efficient strategy. Find out how you can legally pay fewer taxes than ever before with our new personalized tax reduction analysis. In the analysis, you'll discover techniques specifically designed just for you on forward-looking tax strategies to keep more of your hard-earned money in your pocket. And let's take a look at some of those charitable strategies, see if they make sense for you. There's no cost and no obligation, so you really got nothing to lose, but you do need to call in the next five minutes for your complimentary personalized tax reduction analysis at 888-994-6257, 888-994-6257. This could be the turning point. Call now, 888-994-6257. That's it for us. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. Check us out on the podcast at uh, iTunes. And join us Tuesday for our webinar. Go to purefinancial.com if you want to learn more about Medicare. Uh, for Big Al Clopine, I'm Joe Anderson. want to thank Dr. Katie for joining us today as well. All right, that's it for us. We'll see you next week. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth.